when the battle's lost and won. That will be ere the set of sun. Where the blaze? Upon the heath. There to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grey Malkin. Had a call. Anon. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. Hover through the fog. Point against point, rebellious arm against arm. And to conclude, the victory fell on us. No more that thane of Cordor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go, pronounce his present death, and with his former title, greet Macbeth. I will see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. The weird sisters, hand in hand, posters of the sea and land, thus to go about, about. Thrice is thine, and thrice is thine, and thrice again to make up nine. Peace, the charms wound up. A drum, a drum, that beck doth come. So foul and clear a day I have not seen. How far is it called? Fort. <laughs> what are these? <laughs> so withered and so wild in their attire would look not like the inhabitants of the earth, and yet are off. Live you? Or are you all that man may question? You seem to understand it. 
by each at once your choppy fingers lay upon your skinny lips. Ha! You should be women. Yet your beards do forbid me to interpret that you are so. Speak if you can. What are you? Hail to thee! Hail Macbeth, thane of glass! Hail to thee! Hail to thee, thane of Cordor! <laughs> Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that you sound so fair? In the name of truth, are ye fantastical or are ye all that men may question? But my noble partner, you greet with pleasant place and great behavior of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped with all yet. Uh, if you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me. You neither beg nor fear your favours nor your hate. Hail! 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 Hail. Hail. Lesser than the best, but greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings. Speakers. Tell me more. By Finlay's death, I know I am vain of glance. But how of Cordor, vain of Cordor lives. The king stands not within the prospect of belief, no more than to be Cordor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence. Or why upon this blasted heat do you stop our way with such prophetic greetings? Speak, I charge you. Told. 
as happy prologue to the swelling act of the imperial theme. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill. It cannot be good. If ill, why hath it given me earnest of success commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cordell. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion? Torrid image that will fix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature. Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder is much yet fantastic, shapes so by a single state that function is smothered in surmise, and nothing is what is not. Look how our partners wrap. Chance will have me king white. Chance may crown me without my stern. New honors would fall upon me. And like our strange garments, they cleave not to their mold until the use of time. Come what come may. Time and the hour runs through the roughest day. Worthy with men, we wait upon your leisure. Give me your favors. My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read it. Let us toward the king. Think upon what I've chanced to And that more time, interim, having weighed it. Let us speak our three hearts, each to other. Very glad. Until then. Come, friend! Execution done on Cordor. Are those in commission not yet returned? My leash, they are not yet come back. Though I have spoke with one that saw him die, who did report that, very frankly, he confessed his treasons, implored your highness's pardon, and set forth on a deep repentance. There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman upon whom I built an absolute trust. A worthiest cousin, the sin of my ingratitude even now was heavy on me. Thou art so far before, the swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. <laughs> Would that thou hadst less deserved that the proportion both of thanks and of payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all can pay. The service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Your Highness's part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state children and servants which do but what they should in doing everything safe towards your love and honour. Welcome hither! I have begun to plant thee and will labour to make you full of growing. Noble Banquo, that hath no lacks deserved nor must be known no less to have done so. Let me enfold thee and hold thee to my heart. Uh, there if I grow, the harvest is your own. <laughs> my plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Sons, kinsmen, Danes, and you whose places are the nearest, know that we shall establish our estate on our eldest Malcolm, whom we name hereafter Prince of Cumberland. The Prince, Prince of, of Cumberland. Cumberland! Which title must not unaccompanied invest him only but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deserters. 
From hence to Inverness. And bind us further to you. The rest is labour which is not used for you. I'll be myself the harbinger. I make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach. So humbly take my leave. My worthy Cordon. That is a step on which I must fall down. Or else only for in my way it lies. Commendations, I am fed. It is a banquet to me. <laughs> Come, let's after him whose care has gone before to bid us welcome. It is a peerless kinsman. <laughs> they met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfectest report that they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it, came missives from the king, who all hailed me fame of cordon. By which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with Hail King that shalt be. This have I thought good to deliver thee my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightst not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart, and farewell. Flams thou art, and cordial, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, God, not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily. Wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou wouldst have great arms, that which that cries. Thus thou must do, if thou have it, rather than thou fearest to do, then wishes should be undone. Hide thee hither, then I may call my spirits in thine ear, and chastise thee with the valour of my tongue. All that impedes thee from the golden round which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned with all. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. Is not my master with him? It was so would have informed for preparation. Oh, so please you, it is true. Our thane is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him who almost stood for breath, scarcely had more than would make up his message. You contending, he brings great news. The raven himself is hoarse, the croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of the direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breast and take thy milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief, come, thick night, and pull thee in the dumbest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, Hold! Hold! Great gloves, worthy cordial, greater than both by the all hail hereafter, My letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I see now the future in the instant. My dearest love, 
Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall sum that morrow see. Your face, my fame, is as a book where men may read strange matters to beguile the time look like the time. Their welcome in your hand, your tongue, your eye look like the innocent flower that be a serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall lead this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our days and nights to come give solely sovereign sway and master them. We will speak further. Only look up clear. To alter favour ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. In this castle hath a pleasant seat. The air sweetly and nimbly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. Oh, see, see, our honoured hostess. Herein I teach you how you shall bid God yield us for your pains and thank us for your trouble. All our service in every point twice done and then done double, where poor and single business to contend against those honours broad and wide wherein your majesty loads our house. Uh, where is the Thane of Cawdor? We cost him at the heel and had a purpose to be his purveyor. But he rides well, and his great love sharp as his spell hath hope him to his home before us. Fair noble hostess, we are your guest tonight. Your servants ever have theirs themselves, and what is theirs in comp to make audit at your highness's pleasure, still to return your own? Conduct me to my host. We love him highly, and shall continue our graces towards him. Are you leave, hostess? <laughs> if it were done once it's done, then twere well it were done quickly. If the assassination to trammel up the consequence and catch with his Circe success that but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all here, but here, upon this bank and shoal of time we'd jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here, which we do but teach bloody instruction, which being taught, return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poisoned chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First as I am his kinsman, and his subject, strong both against the deed, then as his host. Who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan has been so weak. I've been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off, and pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast. Or well, heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye, that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spurs to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which overleaps itself and falls on the other. How oh, now, what news? He's almost sucked. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? No, you not, he has. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honoured me a 
of late. And I've bought golden opinions from all sorts of people which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time such I account thy love. Art thou afeard? to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire. Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem? Letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage. Privy peace! I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was then? made you break this enterprise to me. When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be so much more, you'd be so much more the man. Nor time, nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now doesn't make you. We should fail. We fail. But screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. When Duncan is asleep, or to the rather shall his hard day's journey soundly invite him. His two chains, will I, with wine and wassail, so convinced that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a few, the receipt of reason and Drenched nature lies as in death. What cannot you and I perform upon the engarbed Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great conquest? Bring forth men, children only. Thy undaunted metal can compose nothing but males. They not be received. We have marked with blood, sleeping too in his own chamber, and used their very daggers. But they have done. Who dares to receive it ever? As we shall make our grief and clamor roar upon his death. I am second. I bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Away! Mock the time the fairest show. False face must hide, the false heart doth hide.
being unprepared, our will became the service to defect which else should free have wrought all well. I dreamt last night that the three weird sisters you they showed some truth. I think not of them. Yet when we can entreat an hour to serve, we will spend it in some words upon that business if you will grant the time at uh, your kindest leisure. If you shall cleave to my consent, when it is, it will make honour for you. So I lose none in seeking augment it, but that I keep my bosom franchised and my allegiance clear, I shall be counsel. Good repose the while. Thanks, sir. The kind to you. Go bid thy mistress. When my drink be ready, she ring upon the bell. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle towards my hand. Come, let me clutch thee. <laughs> I have thee not. Yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind? A false creation proceeding from the heat oppressive brain. Oh. Ah. I see thee yet. And in form as palpable as this, which now I draw. Thou marshalst me the way that I was going. Such an instrument I was to use. On mine eyes and me, the fools of the other senses. Or else worth all the rest, I see thee still. And on thy blade and dudgeon, ounce of blood, which was not so before. There is no <laughs> such thing! It is the bloody business which informs us to mine eyes. Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps which way they walk, for fear the very stones do prate my whereabouts. And take the present horror from the time, which now suits with it. Whilst I threat, he lives. Words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven, or to hell. that gives us sternest good night. Is about it. The doors are open, and the surfeited grooms do muck their charge with snores. I drug their possets, that nature and death contends about them whether they live or die. Who's there? What? Oh! Alack, I'm afraid they've awaked and tis not done. The attempt and not the deed confounds us. Ah. Oh. 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 Oh.
Because he slept, I'd have done it. Oh. My husband. I've done the deed. Didst thou not hear a noise? I heard the owls scream and the crickets cry. Did you not speak? When? Now. As I descended. I... Ha! Who lies in the second chamber?
Faith. But this place is too cold for help. I will never part of it, no father. No! I would have thought I would have seen some of all the fishes that go to Finnegan's Reef. Did he have a last in Bonfire? Till the second coat and drink, son. Drink is a great provoker of three things. Aye, what three things does drink especially provoke? <laughs> Marry, sir. Nose painting. Sleep. And urine. Literally, sir. It provokes and it unprovokes. It provokes the desire, but it takes away the performance. Eh? Therefore, drink can be known to be an equivocator for lechery. Eh? It makes him and it mars him. Sits him all. Sits him all. It persuades him and disheartens him. Makes him, makes him stand to. Yeah. And, and not stand to. <laughs> in conclusion, equivocates him in a sleep and giving him the lie, leaves him. I believe Drake gave me the lie last night. I, I, I did. The very throat of me. But I acquitted him on his lie. And I think that being too strong for him. No, he did take up my legs sometimes. But I made a shift to cast him. No. <laughs> Is thy master stirring? Knocking is awake, Tim. Here he comes. Ah, good morrow, noble sir. 
Good morrow, both. Is the king stirring, worthy thing? Not yet. He did command me to call timely on him. I have almost slipped the hour. I'll bring you to him. I know this is a joyful trouble to you, but yet tis what. The labour we delight in, business pain. Here's the door. I'll make so bold to call. For it's my limited service. Goes the king hence today? He does. He did appoint, sir. Well, the night has been unruly. Where we lay, our chimneys were blown down, and as they say, lamentings heard in the air, strange screams of death, and prophesying with accents terrible, dire combustion and confused events. It was a rough night. Oh, horror! 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 Tongue nor heart cannot conceive nor name thee. What is the matter? Confusion now hath made his masterpiece. Most sacrilegious murder hath broke up the Lord's anointed temple and stole hence the life of the building. What is you say? The life! Me knew his majesty! Uh, approach the chamber and destroy your sight. Do not bid me speak. See. And speak yourselves. Should be so 
Chinchock, it was both the safer. Well, here we are. Daggers and men's smiles. The needing blood, the needed blood. This murderous shaft that shot hath not yet been lighted. And our safest way is to avoid aim. Therefore, to horse. And let us not be dainty of leave taking, but shift away. There's warrant in that theft which steals itself when there's no mercy left. <laughs> Is it not known yet who did this more than bloody deed? Those that Macbeth hath slain. The last of the day. Who could they pretend? They were suborned. Malcolm and Donaldbane, the king's two sons, are stolen away and fled, which puts upon them suspicion of the deed. Against nature still, thriftless ambition, thou not raven up thine own life's means. It is most like the sovereignty will fall upon Macbeth. He's already named and got to scoon to be invested. And you, you are to scoon? No, cousin. Out of fact. Well, then I will thither. Well, may you see things well done there. Have you? Lest our old robes sit easier than our new. Thou hast it now. King Cordor glanced all as the weird sisters promised. And I fear thou hast played the most foul for <coughs> Yet it was said it should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If there come truth from them, may not. Your verities be made good on me, and, and make your oracles mine. Set me in my own hope, but hush, no more. Here's our chief guest. And if it be forgot, it should be as a gap in our great feast, and all things unbecoming. Tonight, sir, we shall hold a solemn supper, and I'll request your presence. And let your highness command to the which my duties are with an indissoluble tie forever knit. Right you this afternoon. Aye, my lord, as far you ride. As far my lord as time will fix. Twixt this and supper. We hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parasite, filling their hearers with strange invention. But of that tomorrow, and therewithal, we shall have cause of state craving us jointly. Those flee on, sweet. Aye, my good lord. At the time calls upon us, I you taught. <laughs> Farewell. We shall keep ourselves tonight till supper time alone. And those gentlemen are a pleasure. They are, my lord, without the palace gate. Bring them before us.
to be thus. Is nothing. But to be saved thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep. And in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. Tis much he dares. And to that dauntless temper of his mind, he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valour to act in safety. There is none but he whose being I do fear. He chid the sisters when first they put the name of king upon me and bade them speak to him. Then prophet-like, they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head, they placed a fruitless crown, but a barren scepter in my gripe, thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. If be so, for Banquo's issue have I filed my mind. For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered put rancors in the vessel of my peace for them, a mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings, the seed of Banquo kings. Rather than so, come fate into the list and champion me for the utterance. Who's there? It's not yesterday we spoke. It was. So please, Your Highness. And have you considered of my speeches? Know you that it was he in the times past that held you so under fortune that you had thought been our innocent self? You made it known to us. I did so. And went further. Which is now our second point of meeting. Do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? Are you so gospel to pray for this good man and his issue whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours forever? I am one, my liege, whom the vile blows and buffets of this world have so incensed me that I am reckless what I do to spite the world. Thy mother, so weary with disasters, took with fourteen that I would set my lie on any cats to mend it or be bid on it. Both of you know Banquo was your enemy. So is he mine. And it's such bloody distance that every minute of his being thrust against my nearest of life. And though I could, with bare-faced power, sweep him from my sight and bid my will about it, yet I must not, for certain friends that are both his and mine, whose loves I may not drop, but weigh or his for who I myself struck down. We shall, my lord, perform what you command. Within the hour, at most, I will advise thee where to plant thyself. Acquaint thee with a perfect spy of the time, the moment on what must be done tonight, and something from the castle. Always thought I require clearness. And with him, to leave no rubs nor botches in the world, flails his son, that keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than is his father's, must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Resolve yourselves apart, I'll come to you or not. soul's flight, if it find heaven, must find it out tonight. Is Banquo gone from court? Aye, madam, but returns again 
tonight. Say to the king I would attend his leisure for a few words. Madam, I will. Not sad, all spent, for our desire is got without content. It is safer to be that which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. And now, my lord, I do keep alone, sorry as fancies your companions making, using those thoughts which should have died with them, you think on. Things without all remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. Oh, we have scotched the snake, not killed it. It is better to be with the dead than we to gain our piece of scent to peace than on the tortured nature of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Nor steel, nor poison, malice domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. Come on, gentle, my good lord. Sleep over your rugged looks. Be bright and jovial, and we'll not guess tonight. So shall I, my love. And so I pray be you. Let your remembrance apply to Bath. Present him evidence with both eye and tongue, and save the while that we must lave our honours in its flattering streams, making our faces visage to our hearts, disguising what they are. You must leave this! Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife! Thou knowest. Bankro and his flayons lives. But in the nature's copies, not a turn. Ah, there's comfort yet. They are assailable. Then be thou jocund. Ere the battered flown its cloistered flight to black Hecate summons, there shall be done a deed of dreadful note. What's to be done? Be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till thou applaud the deed. Night thickens, the crow makes wing to the rocky wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, whilst night's black angels to their prey. Thou marvelst at my word, but hold thee still. Things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. So prithee, go with me. Did bid thee join with us. Beth, Beth. He needs not our mistrust, since he delivers our officers and what we have to do to the direction just. Uh, stand with us. The West yet glimmers with some streaks of day. Now spurs the latent traveller apace to gain the timely inn. Fear approaches the subject of our watch. Hark! I hear horses. To the left, the horse! The rest are all within the notes of expectation, or already in court. His horses go about. Almost a mile, but it does usually, as all men do, from hence to the palace gate, make it their walk. Tis it. Stand to it. It will be red, right? Let it come down. Stretch! Blight! Blight!
play the humble host and mingle with society. Our hostess keeps her state, but in best time we will require her welcome. Announce it for me, sir, to all our friends. As my heart speaks, they are welcome. Oh. See, they encounter thee with their thanks. Both sides are even. Here I'll sit in the midst. Be large in mirth, and on, we'll drink a measure of the table round. Most worthy friends, I have a st strange infirmity, which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love and help to all, then I'll sit down. <laughs> Bring me some wine. Filthful. I drink to the general joy of the whole table. Shall never tremble. Hate or emotion. 
such things be, and overcome us like a summer's cloud without our special wonder. You make me strange, and even to the disposition that I owe, you can behold such sights, and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks, whilst mine is blanched with fear. What sights, my lord? Pray you speak not. He grows worse and worse. Question enrages him. At once, good night. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once! Good night. Better health attend his majesty. A kind good night to all. It will have blood. They say blood will have blood. Stones have been known to move, and trees to speak. What is the night? Almost at odds with the morning, which is which. How sayst thou that Macduff denies his person at our great bidding? Did you send to him, sir? I hear it by the way, but I will send. There's not a one of them but in his house I do keep a servant. I will tomorrow, and betimes I will, to the weird sisters. More shall they speak, for now I am bound to know by the worst means, the worst, for mine own good. All cause shall give way. in blood, stepped so far, should I wade no more, returning was tedious as go on. Strange things I have in head, that will to hand, which must be acted, ere they may be scanned. You lack season of all nature's sleep. <laughs> sleep. Come. We are to sleep. My strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear that wants hard use. We are yet but young indeed. Speeches 
have but hit your thoughts, which can interpret further. May I say, things have been strangely born for peace. But from broad words, because he failed his presence at the tyrant's feast, I hear Macduff lives in disgrace. Sir, can you tell where he bestows himself? The son of Duncan, from whom this tyrant keeps the view of birth, lives in the English court, where he is received of the most pious Edward with such grace that the malevolence of fortune nothing takes from his high respect. Thither is gone Macduff to pray the holy king upon his aid to wake Northumberland and warlike Seaward. This report hath so exasperated the king that he prepares for some attack of war. Sent he to Macduff? He did. And with an absolute sir, not I, the cloud messenger turns me his back and comes as who should say, you'll rue the time that clogs me with this answer. That might well advise him to a caution, to hold what distance his wisdom can provide. Some holy angel, fly to the court of England and unfold his message. Here he come, that a swift blessing may soon return to this, our suffering country, under a hand accursed. I'll send my prayers with him. Unknown power. He knows thy thoughts. Hear his speech and say them not. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Beware, Macduff. Beware the thane of fight. Dismiss me enough. Whate'er thou art, for thy good caution, thanks. Thou hast 
parked my fear aright. Yet one word more. He will not be commanded. Here comes another more I'll make assurance double sure, and take a bond of fate. Thou shalt not live, that I may tell pale-hearted fear it lies, and sleep in spite of thunder. What is this? It rises like the issue of a king, and wears upon its baby brow the round and top of sovereignty. Listen, but speak not to it. Be lion metalled, proud, and take no care for chiefs who frets or where conspirers are. But best shall never vanquish thee until great burning wood to high Dunstanian Hill shall come against him. Well, that will never happen! Who can impress the forest? Bid the tree and fix his earth-bound root. No man, sweet boatman's good. Rebellion's dead. Rise never till the wood of Burnham rise. And our high-placed Macbeth shall live the lease of nature. Pay his breath to time and mortal custom. Yet, my heart throbs to know one thing. Tell me, if thou art can tell so much, shall Banquo's issue ever reign in this kingdom? Shh. Oh. Seek to know no more. I will be satisfied! Deny me this, and an eternal curse fall on you. Tell me now! <laughs> oh. Show, show, show! Oh. Oh. Show his eyes oh. and grieve his heart. Come like oh. shadows, so depart! of Banquo. Down! Thy crown to see in mine eyeballs. And thy hair, thou other gold-bound brow, is like the first. A third is like the former. Filthy hands! Why do you show me this? A fourth. Start eyes what will this line stretch out to the crack of doom. Another yet. A seventh. I'll see no more! And yet, the eighth appears, who bears a glass that shows me many more. Oh. And on some I see the twofold balls and treble scepters carry. <laughs> Horrible sight! And now I see it is true. For the blood-bolted Banquo smiles upon me and points at them for his. <laughs> what is this so? Where are they? Go. Let this pernicious hour stand I accursed in the calendar. Come in without that! What's your relationship? Saw you the way it sisters. No, my lord. Came they not by you? No, indeed, my lord. Infected be the air whereon they ride, and down be those.
had he done to make him fly the land? You must have patience, madam. He had none. His flight was madness. When our actions do not, our fears do make us traitors. You know not whether it was his wisdom or his fear. Wisdom! To leave his wife, to leave his babes, his mansions and his titles in a place from whence himself does fly. He loves us not. He wants the natural touch. For the poor wren, the most diminutive of birds, will bite her young ones in her nest against the owl. All is the fear and nothing is the love. As little is the wisdom when the flight so runs against all reason. Dearest cousin, I pray you, school yourself. But for your husband, he is judicious, noble, and wise, and, and knows the bits of the season. I must take my leave from you. It will not be long. I return again. Sweet cousin. A blessing upon you. Father they are, and yet they're fatherless. Am I so much a fool that I should stay longer? It would be my disgrace and your discomfort. I must take my leave at once. Bless you, fair dame. I am not to you know, though in your state of honour I am perfect. I doubt some danger does approach you near. If you will take a homely man's advice, be not found here. Hence with your little ones. Heaven preserve you. I dare abide no longer. Whither should I fly? I have done no harm. Where's your husband? I hope in no place so unsanctified where such as thou mayest find him. He's a traitor! That light! Villain! You fool! Give way!
visitors seek out some desolate shade, and there weep our sad bosoms empty. Let us rather hold fast the mortal sword, and like good men bestride our downfall birth them. Each new morn, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face, this tyrant, whose soul name blisters our tongues, was once thought honest. You have loved him well, though he hath not touched you yet. I am young, but something you may deserve of him through me and wisdom to offer up a, a weak, poor, innocent lamb to appease an angry God. I am not treacherous. But Macbeth is. A good and virtuous nature may recoil in an imperial charge, but I shall crave your pardon for what you are. My thoughts cannot transpose. I have lost my hopes. <laughs> Perchance even now where I did find my doubts. Why, in that rawness, left you wife and child? Those precious motives, those strong knots of love, without leave taking? I pray you, let not my jealousies be your dishonours for mine own safeties. You may be rightly just whatever I shall think. Fare thee well, Lord. I would not be the villain that thou thinkst, for the whole space that's in the tyrant's grasp, and the richest to boot. Be not offended, I speak not as an absolute fear of you. I think our country sinks beneath the yoke. I oh, weeps, it bleeds, and each new day a gash is added to her wounds. But for all this, when I shall tread upon the tyrant's head, or wear it on my sword, yet my poor country shall have more vices than it had before, more suffer, and more sundry ways by him that shall succeed. What should he be? It is myself, I mean, in whom I know all the particulars of that vice, so graft to that, when they shall be opened, black Macbeth will see them as pure as snow. Not in the legions of horrid hell could come a devil more damned than evils to top Macbeth. I grant him bloody, luxurious, avaricious, false, Deceitful, sudden, malicious smacking of every sin that has a name. But there is no bottom, none to my voluptuousness. Oh, your wives, and your daughters, and your matrons, and your maids could not fill the cistern of my lust. And my desire, all continents and permanents, would I bear them to depose my will? Better Macbeth than such a wanton age. Boundless intemperance in nature is a tyranny. And it hath been the untimely emptying of the happy throne and fall of many kings. Yet do not fear to take upon you what is yours. We have willing dames enough. With this, there grows in my most ill composed affection. And he's such a staunchless avar as that. Were I king, oh, I should cut off the nobles of their lands, desire his jewels, this other's house, destroying him for wealth. This avarice sticks deeper grows with more pernicious roots than summer seeming lust, and it hath been the sword of our slain kings. Yet do not fear. Scotland hath foisons to fill up your will of your mere own. All these are portable with other graces' ways. I have none! None! The king becoming graces, I have no relish of them, nay! Had I power, 
I should pour the sweet milk of concord into hell. Uproar universal peace. Confound all unity on earth. Scotland. Scotland. If such a one be fit to govern, speak. I am as I have spoken. Fit to govern? No. Not to live. Oh, nation miserable, when shalt thou see thy wholesome days again, since that the truest issue of thy throne by his own interdiction stands accused? Thy royal father was a most sainted king. The queen that bore thee up there upon her knees then on her feet died every day she lived. Fare thee well, Lord. These evils thou repeatest upon thyself have banished me from Scotland. Oh, my breast, thy hope ends here. Macduff, this noble passion, child of integrity, had from my soul wiped the black scruples, reconciled my thoughts to thy good truth and honour. Here abjure the taints and blames I laid upon myself. I am yet unknown to woman, never was forsworn, have scarcely coveted what was my own. What I am truly is thine, and my poor country's to command. Whether indeed before thy uh, dear approach, all seaward, with ten thousand warlike men, already at a point was setting forth. Now, wheel together. Chance of our goodness <laughs> be like our warranted quarrel. Why are you silent? Such welcome and unwelcome things at once. <laughs> Tis hard to reconcile. <laughs> <laughs> See who comes here. It is my countryman, yet I know him not. Oh, my ever gentle cousin. Welcome, Heather. Sir. Amen. Stand Scotland where it did. Alas. Oh, country. Almost afraid to know itself. It cannot be called our mother, but our grave. How does my wife? Why, well. And all my children? Well, too. The tyrant has not battered at their peace. Aye, they were at peace when I last did see them. It's their comfort. We are coming thither. But gracious England hath lent us good seaward and ten thousand men. Would I could answer this comfort with the like. But I have words that could be howled out in the desert air where hearing should not latch them. What concern they? The general cause? Or is it a fee grief due to some single breast? No mine, that's honest. But in it shares some woe. Though the main part pertains to you alone. Be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly, let me have it. Let not your ears despise my tongue forever. Your castle is surprised. Your wife and babes savagely slaughtered. And to relate that manner 
where on the quarry of your slaughtered deer, to add the death of you, children, too. It is as I said. And I must be the nurse. But my wife killed, too. Wife, children, servants, all that could be found. Be comforted. Let us make medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. He has no children. All my pretty ones. Did you say all? shaking, and the powers above have put on their instruments. Receive what cheer you may, the night is long that never finds the day. I have two nights watched with you, yet can perceive no truth in your report. When was it she last walked? Since his majesty went into the field. I have seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, ah. write on it, read it, seal it afterwards, yet again return to bed, and all this whilst in a most vast sleep. Great perturbation in nature, to receive at once the benefits of sleep, yet do the effects of watching. In this slumbery agitation, besides her walking and other actual performances, what at any time have you heard her say? That's so, which I cannot report after her. You may to me, it is most meet you should. Neither you nor anyone, having no witness to confirm my statement. No, here she comes. This is her very guise, and upon my life, fast asleep. Observe her. Stand close. How came she by that light? I have just stood by her. She has it with her continually. It is her very command. You see, her eyes are open. See how she rubs her hands. It is a continued action with her. It is seen thus washing her hands. I have known her continue some quarter of an hour. Yet here's a spot. Oh, she speaks. Sir. I will set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. Out, damn spot, out, I say! One, two. I think it is time to do it. Hell. 
is murky. Fie, my lord, fie, a soldier and a feared. What need we fear who knows it when none can call our power to account? Yet who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? You mark that? The vein of fight had a wife. Where's she now? Will his hands ne'er be clean? No more of that, my lord, no more of that. You mar all with this starting. She has spoke of what she should not have. I am sure of it. Heaven knows what she has known. Yet here's the smell of the blood. Still, all the perfumes of Arabia cannot sweeten this little hand. <laughs> this disease is beyond my practice. Yet I have known those which have walked in their sleep who have died holily in their beds. Wash your hands, put on your nightgown, look not so pale. I tell you yet again, Banquo is buried, he cannot come out his grave! she go now to bed? Directly. How whisperings are abroad. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural trouble. If infected minds for their death pillows will discharge their secrets. For each she the divine and the physician. God forgive us all. Look after her. Remove from her the means of all annoyance still keep eyes upon her. But so good night. My mind she has mated and amazed my sight, and I think and dare not speak. Good night, good doctor. Green-faced loon. 
Where gotst thou that goose look? There are ten thousand, my lord. Geese, villain. The soldiers, sir. Go prick thy face and overread thy fear, thou lily-livered boy. What soldiers patch? Death on thy soul! Those linen cheeks of thine are counsellors to fear. What soldiers wait face? The English forces to please you. Go take thy face hence. Satan! I am sick at heart when I behold. Satan, I say! This push will cheer me ever, or this seat me now. Satan! What news more? All that's reported is confirmed, my lord. I'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked. Bring me mine armor. Tis not needed yet. I'll put it on. Give me mine armor. Send out more horses, stir the country round, hang those that talk of fear. Give me my armor! How does thy patience, doctor? Not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick coming fancies which keep her from her rest. Cure her of that. What? Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? Pluck out from the memory a rooted sorrow. Raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet, oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that pernicious stuff which weighs heavy on the heart. Therein the patient must minister to himself. <coughs> Throw physic to the dogs. I'll none of it. Satan! Give me my armor! And my staff, send out, I will not be afraid of death and bane till Burnham Forest do come to Dunsinane. Were I from Dunsinane away and clear, prophets again should hardly draw me here. Full with horrors. 
dying as familiar to my slaughterous thoughts, cannot one starve me. Wherefore was that cry? The queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Out, out, brief count. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and is heard no more. Tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. I come to use thy tongue, thy story quickly. Gracious, my lord, I should report that which I say I saw, but know not how to do. What say, sir? As I did my watch upon the hill. I looked towards Burnham and anon methought the wood began to move. Liar and slay. Let me enjoy your wrath, if be not so. Within three mile may you see it coming, I say, a moving grove. If thou speakst most, upon the next tree shalt thou have a life to famine cling thee. If thy speech be sooth, I care not if thou do for me as much. Fear not, till burn and forest to come to Dunsinane. And now a wood comes towards Dunsinane. Arm! Arm and out! Ring the alarm bell! Blow red! Come rack! At least we'll die with harness on our back! Served. Tell thee, Macduff, 
was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. Time is free. Hail, King of Scotland. Yes. 